this room and seeing no faces today except for what's online, I want to thank you that we have the capability to look online and to gather together online. Father, uh, this has just been such an ordeal to remember that you tell us not to give up fellowshipping with one another. And I'm beginning to understand why, because even attending church online and attending as many churches as I want to online and coming here and being able to um, fellowship online and learn, it's wonderful, Lord, but it's really not the same as being together one with another. However, this is where we are right now, and I just want to rejoice with you in this and with all my friends, as we know that you are here with us. doesn't say where two or more are gathered physically. It says where two or more are gathered, and I believe that spiritually and right here together online. We are of one mind and one body, and we thank you that we are able to still study your word. Father, we thank you for what you're doing in the world. I know you're shaking up your church. You're shaking up the nation of Israel. And Lord, we are thankful because we know that you're in control. Because if we thought for one minute our shepherd wasn't in control, all of us as sheep would be ruined. But we're not because we're focusing on you. Just that little illustration last week of all the sheep looking at the fire and being able to see that fire in their eyes because they're looking where the shepherd is. Lord, what a beautiful illustration of keeping our eyes on you. So Father, today, as Mark teaches us another lesson from this beautiful Psalm, I pray for each of us, Father, to grasp how important it is to know your word and to know the shepherd. We thank you, Father, for who you are, for what you've done in our lives, and for what you're continuing to do. We do pray that you would bring an end to this in your perfect timing, and Father, that we would never forget the lessons we're learning right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Diane. You're welcome. Um, are we on? We're on. I re I've got recording going. Okay, um, thank you. Let me remind everybody here too that there's um, you're more than welcome because our um, our platform will hold a hundred um, a hundred an audience of a hundred people. So there's nothing that keeps you from texting your friends and saying come join us. Um, yes. You can send them the link and the email, and they can click on the link and just be part of it. So uh, we'd love to have you do that. Um, let me start us with a quick review our first two weeks of studying in our 23 week look at Psalm no, in our six week look at Psalm 23. Um, let me remind you of where we are. First week we talked about the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want and we concluded from that that in the great shepherd I am made complete. In the great shepherd I lack nothing. David literally says the shepherd that I follow is the God of the universe. He is my Lord. He is mine personally. And I have no lack because the shepherd watches over me and cares for me. In the great shepherd, I am made complete. We look at the next phrase. We just lost something there. Uh-oh. Uh, wow. Ooh, that's pretty. We, somebody uh, accidentally accidentally hit some, share their screen. Somebody somebody hit screen share. If you if you hit screen share, could you go back on and un unscreen share it? Not sure who it was that's sharing their screen. Uh, looks like it might be Kitty. If you could go back and, and take off the screen share, the little thing that looks like a TV screen and un, unclick it. <laughs> well. <laughs> Kid, Kitty, Kitty, if you're out there. Mark, I'll share and then unshare, hang on. Okay. 
There's Diane back. Hey, hang on. Okay. All right. We're back. Um, Done. Verse two, he makes me to lie down in green pastures, leads me beside the still waters. Literally translated, he causes me, he creates the situation in which I have the peace to be able to lie down in green pastures and the peace to be able to drink from the still waters. He causes that situation to happen. Um, in the great shepherd, I am at peace then. So the two things we've learned, in the great shepherd, I am complete, and in the great shepherd, I am at peace. These first two wonderful statements from David, and remember where he is. He's writing this from a cave because Absalom, his son, is after him. The nation is after him. So we get to the third verse. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. This is a beautiful, beautiful next phrase, but I want you to notice the verbs that have occurred so far in this passage from David of what the shepherd actually does is on. as the shepherd who cares. The first thing is the shepherd causes or makes me to lie down. The second is the shepherd leads. And now we get to the shepherd restores. The shepherd restores. He's, he causes, he leads, now he restores. He's provided food, he's provided water, he's provided rest, he's provided the environment in which his care becomes all complete for us. And now he restores me. If you look up the word restoration or the word restore in the dictionary, it says five things. First of all, the word restore means to bring back into existence or bring back to its original state. It can also mean to bring back to a state of health. It can also mean to be put back to a former place, something that's restored back to its original place. It can also mean to give back, to make restitution. You restore some wealth that has been um, taken away. And the fifth definition is to reproduce or to reconstruct, as in you reconstruct something, you restore it. Uh, if you're restoring an old building, you're reconstructing an old building. I have a personal, um, very significant personal story about restoration. And if you'll allow me, I want to share it. Um, not that you've ever not allowed me to share personal stories, but this one, this one happened. I was a senior in high school. I was playing basketball, and I've shared a few basketball stories in the past. I had a coach who believed in discipline. He was a fundamental coach. He believed in the fundamentals of the game. And back then, the fundamentals of the game was what was called man-to-man -man defense, meaning you had five people on one side, five people on the other side. You match up man-to-man, -man and you guard them. And the way he would train us in this, the way he would teach us this, is he'd hand, he'd pair us up, one with another guy, he'd put us at different ends of the court, he'd hand us each a basketball, and for an hour we would have to play one-on-one, -on -one, one person against one person. The old statement was mano a mano. Man to man, you would line up and you would play basketball against one person and he would teach you the fundamentals of playing man-to-man -man defense and man-to-man -man offense. And it was, it was grueling because playing solidly, being watched over and playing solidly for an hour was difficult. It was very, very taxing. On this particular day, I was about 5'11". That was my height back then. I'm not quite that tall. I seem to be shrinking as I age. And the guy he partnered me with, my coach partnered me with, was six foot three. He was one of my best friends. He was gangly. He had these long arms, big elbows, long legs. He weighed, he was probably six foot three and weighed about 95 pounds. He was, I'm kidding, but he was thin, very tall, very gangly. And as we were playing basketball, he had the ball. He was, we were at the top of the key at the free court, free throw line. I was guarding him very tightly. He faked to go up for a shot. I did not take the fake and he whirled around and his elbow cracked me right in my two front teeth. Oh. Just 
popped me so hard that I dropped like a rock. I was laying on the ground, um, almost knocked me out. And as I was laying on the ground, he came over to see what was happening. Now I was, I happened to be wearing a white t-shirt with the name Young Life on the front, which was the ministry I was involved in. And as I was laying on the ground, my white shirt was begin beginning to be red because the blood was just gushing from my two front teeth. He turned as white as my shirt. He ran over and got the coach. The coach came over and turned as white as my shirt. And I knew then that there was probably a problem when my coach turned white as my shirt. They called my mom. She came over. They stood me up. My shirt was red uh, with the blood from my mouth. And as we walked out to the car, typical of my mom, love my mom dearly, she handed me a different shirt, asked me to change my shirt so that we wouldn't give Young Life a bad name, having <laughs> <laughs> blood all over my young life shirt. Love my mom. Love my mom. So, and she'll remember this to this day. Took me to an oral surgeon. The oral surgeon took one look in my mouth and went, oh my. I knew I was in trouble. Um, he proceeded to put 12 shots of Novocaine into my mouth. He got into the chair, straddled me in the chair, one knee on either side of me, grabbed my tooth oh. and struggled and popped it back into place. Literally, he restored my tooth. Now, the interesting thing about this is he then put a series of braces up through my gums that held my tooth in place for the next six weeks. One of the ironic things was that morning we had taken our senior picture for the yearbook. Oh. Can you imagine if it had been a day later, I would have looked like I got in a prize fight and lost the fight. So as it happened, both of the teeth, both of my front teeth died and had to have root canals. So they're a little bit different color from the rest of my teeth, which now that I've told you that every time you see me in person, you're gonna be looking yeah. at my two front teeth and saying, let me see those, the colors on those teeth. <laughs> But every time I look in the mirror and I see those two front teeth and I see them lightly a different color, I'm reminded of the, the fact that God restores perfectly. Mm -hmm. Man can never restore perfectly. God can restore perfectly. So David gives us this statement of he restores my soul. God restores perfectly my soul it is a reminder to us of the restoration work of god that's continually going on inside of us but you have to ask yourself the question what did david need to be restored from what did david need res restoration for i um, mean if you listen to psalm 42 you begin to find a little bit of a hint to this david says why are you cast down O my soul and why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. He says the thing that needs to be restored in him is his soul. His soul has been cast down. His soul is disquieted. This is a really fascinating phrase, the word cast down, because in, in terms of sheep, which we're now back to the whole point of our psalm here, in terms of sheep, the shepherd had to be on the lookout for a sheep who was ever cast down. The definition of being cast down, it's an old English term, and literally it means a sheep that has been turned on its back, completely onto its back with its legs in the air, and it cannot right itself. Now, you and you and I not being shepherds, we may never have seen this. The closest I can tell you is when, if you've ever seen a turtle that gets turned upside down, it has a very difficult time writing itself. If a sheep gets cast down, a sheep cannot write itself. It cannot turn itself over. There's a, this is a very difficult situation for a sheep um, for these couple of reasons. First of all, if a sheep gets cast down, turned on its back, its legs up in the air, the blood will rush from the legs and begin to settle into the chest cavity of the sheep. When the blood rushes from the legs, the legs fall asleep. So they can't support it and they can't move their legs. The second thing that happens is as the sheep is cast down, it begins to build up gas in its stomach 
the stomach expands and it can't breathe. If left long enough in a cast down state, the sheep will ultimately die because it will ultimately die of suffocation. It will ultimately not be able to breathe. Philip Keller says this, he says, a cast sheep is a very pathetic sight, lying on its back, its feet in the air. It flays away frantically, struggling to stand up without success. Sometimes it will bleat for a little help, but generally it lies there lashing about in frightened frustration. If the shepherd does not arrive on the scene within a reasonably short period of time, the sheep will die. This is but another reason why it's so essential for a careful shepherd to look over his flock every day counting them all to see that they are all able to stand up on their feet and walk. So there are a number of things that happen um, in this whole prospect of being cast down. Um, the way it actually occurs is that after a sheep has been well fed, after a sheep is eaten, it will go find a little indentation in the ground and it will spread out as far as it can, it will stretch out as far as it can into this depression. The minute it begins to stretch too far, it loses its equilibrium and it will begin to flip over. If it doesn't catch itself, it'll flip over all the way onto its back into this depression. That center of gravity will shift. It loses its ability, the sheep loses its ability to understand where it is in space it loses its equilibrium, it tips over and lays down on its back. When it hits its back, it begins to panic and begins to frantically claw at the air to try to get back. There is only one thing that the sheep can do in a cast down state, and that is hope that the shepherd comes. Mm -hmm. Now you go back to Psalm 42 and you hear, why are you cast down on my soul? Why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God. Mm -hmm. If you find yourself in a cast down state as a, as a sheep, you find yourself frantically clawing at the air on your back, there is one answer. And it is the certainty of hope in God. Now the shepherd has to recognize a few things. The shepherd has to recognize that the sheep is in trouble. He must also find the sheep. And the, prospect, or the, the process of restoration from the shepherd is this. He has to right the sheep. First of all, he has to calm the sheep while it's on its back. He has to bring a sense of peace and calm to the sheep while it's on its back. Then he has to physically right the sheep. And then he has to massage the legs so the blood will get flowing back into the legs so the sheep will actually be able to stand. He must literally restore the sheep back to its original frame so that it can actually walk and it can actually do what's needed to be done. Now, there's a spiritual example of this. There's actually two of them. The first one we see in Luke chapter 15, which is the three parables together, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son, the, the prodigal son. Interesting to note, most Jewish scholars believe that the lost sheep was one who actually had wandered away and become cast down, had turned over on its back and could not find its way back. And we think this because the idea is the shepherd has lifted the sheep onto his shoulders to bring him back, that it's very possible that the, that the sheep had, was not able to walk on its way back because it had been cast down for so long. The blood had rushed from its legs. The other example we get and this is a beautiful one, is in John chapter 21. This is the story of Peter. And you'll remember, Peter denied Jesus three times when Jesus is on his way to the cross. This is 40 days later. They're sitting on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. They're out fishing, and the same circumstance takes place. They see a man walking on the shores. The man tells them to cast their nets out to the other side. They bring in a huge load of fish, and Peter immediately recognizes that that's Jesus on the shore. He jumps out of the boat, swims to shore, and they're all sitting around the campfire. You'll remember, and John 21 tells us this, you'll remember that Peter is the one who denied Jesus three times, and now Jesus looks at him and asks him this question. Peter, do you love me? Peter says, yes, Lord, you know that I do. 
Jesus says, then feed my sheep, become a shepherd. Another time he says, Peter, do you love me? Peter says, Lord, you know that I do. He says, then tend my flock. A third time he says, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, Lord, you, you know that I do. He says, then feed my sheep. Three times for the three sins, Peter gets restored. The sheep gets restored. And actually what Jesus is telling Peter to become is you now need to be a shepherd. You need to shepherd the people I will leave you with. Beautiful, beautiful example of the shepherd restoring Peter back to that forgiveness, back to that place of knowing he's loved, back to that place of he's back on, on solid ground with the shepherd. Psalm 56, verse 13 says this, For you have delivered my soul from death. Have you not kept my feet from failing, that I may walk before God in the light of the living? The reason for restoration is so that we may walk before God in the light of the living. We can walk before God in the light of the living. There are three reasons, and this is going to be a little bit convicting, and I'm sorry, um, but there are three reasons why a, sheep, why a sheep rolls over. Three very specific reasons. The first is they get too comfortable. Ugh. <laughs> yeah, it gets more convicting from there. The first reason is that the, that the sheep gets too comfortable. As it gets so comfortable, it loses its equilibrium, as I said before. It loses its point of balance and rolls over. Think about that for us. Do we pursue comfort over the Lord? If I'm pursuing comfort over the Lord, I'm going to lose my equilibrium. I'm going to lose my balance. I'm going to lose that point at which I know where I am and I'm going to roll over. And when I roll over, I'm in trouble because pursuing comfort, I'm just going to tell you, pursuing comfort solely over pursuing the Lord leads to death. <laughs> the second reason that a sheep gets cast down is that its fleece gets long and heavy. It gets so weighed down by its fleece that it rolls over. It loses that balance again. If we get too weighed down by worldly things, by earthly things, because that's our pursuit, we can get so weighed down by those worldly things and the pursuit of those worldly things that we lose our equilibrium and we roll over on our backs. We get cast down and we die. <clears throat> the third thing, when a sheep gets too heavy, Literally translated, when a sheep becomes unhealthy and unproductive, it can roll over on its back and die. I love the fact, Chuck Swindoll said this in a sermon once, he said, the most productive time in a person's life is between the ages of 55 and 75. The most productive years of a person's life is between the ages of 55 and 75. He was asked the question, why? He said a number of reasons. First of all, you've gathered all of this lifetime of experience you have to put to good use. <clears throat> he said, second, your kids are out from under the house. You have more free time. You have more productive time. You have more wisdom. You have more age. You have more experience. <clears throat> he said the third thing that's really important to understand is that from the ages of 55 to 75, God's not through with you. The world tells you that they're through with you, but God says, I'm not through with you. And Swindoll says the most productive time of a person's life can be between the ages of 55 and 75 because all the encumbrances are off. You have the chance to pursue the Lord and pursue the Lord so fully and, and so completely. You, you have the opportunity not to become so weighted down with the worldly things. So the idea, first the idea of this 
he restores my soul really goes back to the issue of being cast down. This sheep that gets turned over on its back and needs to be restored to its appropriate position. Now, the whole idea of restoration in the sheep has two other uh, definitions, two other ways to translate it. The first one is translated in the book of what's called the Syrian Shepherd. The Syrians were, were well-known shepherds, and they have this interpretation of this passage. The Syrian Shepherd claims this. He says, the reference of this is to the fact that in shepherd country, there are many private gardens and vineyards. And to a sheep, that's hallowed ground. A sheep will, if given the opportunity, will wander into one of those private plots. Here's the point. If it wanders into a private plot, it is then forfeited to the owner of that private plot. Therefore, the phrase, he restores my soul, has the reference to the way in which the divine shepherd brings us back and rec res rescues us when we stray into forbidden and dangerous places. <clears throat> the idea behind this is the shepherd's always on the lookout for those things that look really tempting, those things that look really, really desirable. Remember, go all the way back to the garden, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. He's on the lookout for us wandering off to the point that we become the property of the plot in which we've wandered into. The danger is we can wander so far into those plots that we wander so far away from the shepherd that we never come back. The shepherd, however, is constantly on the lookout to draw us back lovingly, caringly draw us back into the flock and into the fold. Listen to Ezekiel 34. For thus says the Lord God, indeed, I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock on the day he is among his scattered sheep, so I will seek out my sheep and deliver them from all the places where they were scattered on a cloudy and dark day. We've got to be on the lookout for those places that we as sheep will wander off. But we have our hope in the fact that the shepherd is the one that drives us. The shepherd is the one that can pull us back. So the second translation here, one is he restores, restores my soul because I can be cast down. I can be a, a sheep that has, for a number of reasons, landed on my back and I can't get out. I'm also a sheep that, given my own, I'll wander off, and I'll wander off into dangerous places and become captive of the plot that belongs to, to another owner. So I'm looking for the shepherd to bring me back. The third one is this. He restores my soul because I have been burned out. This third interpretation, the believer finds himself spiritually debilitated, spiritually tired, spiritually burned out. Paul points to this, and by the way, we're sitting in a situation where that, that can happen. We can be spiritually burned out. Philippians 2 tells us um, that we have consolation in Christ. In the Greek, that can also be translated, we can be stimulated in Christ. To restore tired, jaded souls, we can be stimulated to Christ. So what we're looking at here is what a missionary described. This was a missionary in India that described this. This restoration of burnout described it this way. That Christ is like the first rainfall of the monsoon season in, Indi in India. The dry, dusty ground so barren and so hard that after a rain the next day, a green film of vegetation comes over the land. The moisture touches the dead soil, and it becomes alive. Jesus touches our parched and barren lives, and they sprout to life with vitality and hope. Now, I lived in Midland for five years, and I can tell you in Midland for five years, that was the case. When we first moved there, in Midland, there had been a drought for 10 years, and the whole land was nothing but dry, barren dirt and dust. Our second year there, the city of Midland got 
four inches above its annual rainfall. Annual rainfall in Midland is 10 inches, 10 inches in a year. They got 14 inches that year. And the green that came across that land was magnificent. Diane and I were just talking about the fact that West Texas right now, even though the oil is going through a really tough, tough run, that there is green everywhere in the land. I love here in the woodlands that when we get the first rain of spring, there is this vibrant green that just seems to take over the land and we're sitting in it. I'm looking out a window right now in which all the trees have this new vibrant green growth. This describes what we're talking about here. This describes that rebirth, that, that newness that comes about. Um, and if you've ever noticed, you can water with your water hose, your plants, but it doesn't bring your plants to life like the rain because there's something in the fact that when God touches his creation with his finger and that rain, something unique happens. Mm -hmm. So what I would ask you is, as, we look, as we've looked in depth at this first passage, he restores my soul, I would ask you this question. Are you cast down? Have you wandered off? Are you burned out? Do you need your soul, your soul restored? Do you need God's heavenly touch to bring the restoration of your soul back to where it was? When we get through today, spend some time with the Lord just thinking through what in my life needs to be restored? What in my life needs to be touched? Am I pursuing comfort too much? Am I pursuing the worldly things? Have I wandered away from God? Am I cast down? Have I, am, am I spiritually burned out because of the things that I hear in this life? If I am, then I need specifically to pray for God's hand to restore me, for the shepherd, because remember, if the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. There's nothing I lack in the care of the shepherd, including his ability to restore me and restore me perfectly. Make sense? Makes sense. Walking through a pretty deep first verse. <laughs> <laughs> Let me move on to the next one. David then says, he leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And it's interesting, this is Hebrew parallelism. So the first sentence, he restores my soul, he leads me in the paths of righteousness, would lead us to believe that there's something comparing those two, that part of my soul's restoration is him leading me in the paths of righteousness. Perhaps I have wandered off the path of righteousness. So let's look at this in specific. As I look back over the first three verses, here's what I see. The Lord is my shepherd. He is the God of the universe. He is the one who cares for me. And in his care, I lack nothing. He causes me to lie down in green pastures if I will allow him to. He creates the situation in which I can go be well fed. I can have sit in green pastures if I will allow myself to follow his lead. He leads me to the place where there is still water for me to drink deeply, if I will follow his lead. <clears throat> he restores my soul, my cast down, my wandered off, my burned out soul, if I will let him. Now, he leads me in the paths of righteousness. And the first statement out of my mouth is this, if I will follow. Paths of righteousness has this Hebrew translation. These are, uh, he leads me in the right path or the paths that are right. These are the ones and in the Hebrew, the, the paths of righteousness really means a clearly marked and well-defined trail. The shepherd leads me on a well-defined, well-marked trail. He leads me on the paths that are correct. I've quoted Selwyn Hughes several times, this Welch pastor from the early 1900s. He says this, <laughs> another convicting statement, sheep, as everyone knows, are stubborn, self-willed creatures. 
If left to themselves, they will almost invariably wander off in a direction of their own choosing. An experienced shepherd is well aware of this and tries to offset this tendency by going ahead of his sheep and making himself as visible as possible. The way the shepherd keeps the sheep on the paths of righteousness is he runs to the front of the pack and makes himself as large as he possibly can so the sheep follow the shepherd. They can see the shepherd and follow him. He makes himself visible. Now I want you to hear several verses that tell us exactly what sheep do and exactly who sheep are. Isaiah 53 says this, the prophet Isaiah says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way and the Lord has laid on Christ the iniquity of us all. Every one of us has turned away. Every one of us has wandered off. Every one of us has gone the way we think we ought to go. Listen to what Proverbs 14, 12 says. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Notice, there is a way that seems right to us. It's exactly the opposite of the way that God wants to lead us. And the way that we choose is the way that leads to death. John 10, 10, Jesus said, I came that you might have life and have it abundantly. The way that we have life and have it abundantly is to follow the shepherd. We as sheep love to walk, love to walk off the path. Romans 3 says, there is none righteous. No, not one. There's none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, not one. We're sheep. We will wander off if we don't follow the shepherd. The final one, Judges 21:25 says this, in those days there was no king in Israel and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Take it to the bank. Sheep will not, if left to themselves, will not follow the path. They need to follow someone who is leading. The idea behind this paths of righteousness, and if you could see it in Israel, it's really a beautiful thing to see. On the hillsides, there are these crisscrossing paths all over the hillside. You can see it. If you just look up paths of righteousness, go do a Google search on paths of righteousness, and you'll see hillsides in Israel absolutely crisscrossing with all of these different paths. These are the well-marked paths that the shepherds know take you from one water hole to the next. They take you from one green field to the next. They take you from one pasture to the next. These are the paths of righteousness. Caroline asked before we got on, how did they, how did they get them down to the, to the cisterns and the wells? On well-worn, well-known paths. Notice, the shepherd has, uh, the sheep have no idea what a path is. The paths of righteousness were for the shepherds to know which path to take them on. The shepherds knew exactly which path took you to the right watering hole and to the right pasture. These paths of righteousness were meant, the paths, the sheep trails were meant for the shepherds to know which way to lead. We have the great shepherd leading us who knows exactly what the paths of righteousness are. And as a matter of fact, the theological point that we get from this is in Christ, his righteousness because of his death and resurrection and our trust and faith in him, his righteousness has been imputed to us. We now have the righteousness of Christ in us. So because of that, the Holy Spirit indwelling us knows which are those right paths. He knows which path to keep us on, which path to lead us on. All of this, because it has been imputed to us, we will, if left to our own, if we don't yield to the Holy Spirit, if we don't follow Christ, we'll wander off on the wrong path. But the shepherd knows the right path, and it's the path of righteousness. This was well known to a Jewish audience because pursuing righteousness this is exactly what they pursued. You get to the new covenant, which is the newest of the covenants. You get to the new covenant in Ezekiel and Jeremiah, and what you hear is, I will write my laws on their heart. That's when we 
understand what God is doing with us is he is taking the paths of righteousness that were in Christ and imputing them to us. So when we follow the shepherd, we know we're on the right path. We know we're on those paths of righteousness because it's the shepherd who knows them and is following and leading us on those. We can walk that way. Now, Different from, from the rest, listen to Philippians 2.13. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it's God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Here's the point. Paul tells us, work out the salvation that you received from Jesus Christ. Work out how it looks in your life. Work out what those paths of righteousness are. Work out how you follow the shepherd in your daily life. Work out how you yield to the Holy Spirit in your daily life. You have his righteousness in you. Let that lead you. Let the shepherd lead you. Follow the Holy Spirit in this. He's made himself very big and very visible out in front. <laughs> the question is, will we follow the shepherd? He knows the path. He knows where to lead us. He knows to lead us to life. He knows to lead us to the good, clear water. He knows to lead us to the pastures. Are we going to follow him? I love the story that E. Stanley Jones tells. It's a missionary who got lost in the African jungle. And he's hacking his way through the jungle and he finally comes into a clearing. When he reaches the clearing, there's a couple of little huts in the clearing and he goes over and he knocks on a door. The man comes out and in kind of broken language, the missionary asks him, could you please show me the way out? I'm lost. I don't know where the path is. I can't find my way out. The man looks at him and says, fine, follow me. As they begin to go through the path, through the jungle, he's hacking away the, the, the guide, the, the native is hacking through the jungle and as he gets Finally, about half an hour into this jungle, the missionary stops him and he says, I'm looking around and I don't see a path. You just seem to be cutting branches down. Are we still lost? Where is the path? And the man stops him and looks at him and says, out here, there is no path. Out here, I am the path. Oh, wow. Christ is our path. Even when we can't see the trail, Christ is our path. He is the one we need to follow. And what we need to understand is where he leads, just so you've got it clear, where he leads is where there is cool, clear water. Where he leads is where there are green pastures. Where he leads is where the good shepherd is. He leads you back to himself. Keller says this, Philip Keller, who wrote the little book, uh, a sh a Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23. Whenever the shepherd opens the gate to a fresh pasture, the sheep are filled with excitement. As they go through the gate, even the staid old ewes will often kick up their heels and leap with delight at the prospect of fresh feed. How they enjoy being led to new ground. Mm -hmm. I would ask you the question, does that describe you? Does it describe me? Am I looking for the opportunity every day to feel this way with excitement in my relationship with the Lord? Selwyn Hughes says it this way, God wants us to move with him day by day to discover new insights and fresh revelation as he opens up to us the glories of his precious word. Every Christian should meet the day with as much delight as the sheep that is being led to new pasture. Spiritually, we should kick up our heels and leap with delight at the prospect of finding fresh food. Expect God to show you some new insight day by day. Faith is expectancy. According to your expectancy, so it will be unto you. The shepherd says, I will restore your soul. The shepherd says, I will lead you in the paths of righteousness. The shepherd says, I will bring you to new pastures, to fresh waters, if you will just follow me. Am I expecting the shepherd to do that for me? And when he does it, how do I respond? Do I recognize it? And do I respond? 
I know in this time period, it's hard because, I, and I agree with Diane in her prayer, we love to be in the midst of people. We love to be in that fellowship. Right now, we're getting a chance, and I, I, it, it, it pains me to only be able to have the chance to see you all in a small picture on the screen and not be able to shake and to hug and to, to, to well wish and to, to, to give a, a, a holy kiss. But from that standpoint, we still have this opportunity. And I would ask the question, how do I approach this? How do I respond to even this? Thank the Lord for this technology. Thank him for the opportunity for us to meet together. How are we connecting after this? What do we do and how do we take this? How do we encourage one another to follow the lead of the shepherd in this difficult time? The last thing he says in this passage, he restores my soul, no matter the condition of my soul, he restores it, he brings it back. He leads me in these paths of righteousness. The shepherd knows the paths, he takes me along the path. In fact, he's imputed that righteousness into me and he does it for his name's sake. Dr. A.A. Anderson says this, he says he acts for the sake of his reputation. God acts for the sake of his reputation. In other words, the lives of the sheep reflect on the care of the shepherd. I want you to ask yourself one more difficult question. How am I reflecting the care of the shepherd in my life? Does my life to anybody else show the care of the shepherd? We do this. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness. And he does this for the sake of his reputation, that his name might be known. Because you, the sheep, reflect the name of the shepherd. The people around you, the people you interact with, the people that you connect with, your family, your friends, they know the shepherd because of you. They know the shepherd because of how the, the care of the shepherd is reflected in your life. How am I reflecting the care of the shepherd? How am I, how am I keeping his names, his name safe? How am I reflecting the name of the shepherd caring in my life? So with this third verse, we get this final statement. In the great shepherd, I am restored and I am made righteous. Let me repeat these three as we walk them through. In verse one, we get, in the great shepherd, I am made complete. I lack for nothing. The second verse, in the great shepherd, I am at peace. In the great shepherd, verse three, I am restored and made righteous. You could really put a period at the end of the first three verses and just shout and sing praises to God all day long for the fact that you are made complete in him, you are at peace in him, you have been restored and made righteous in him. And in that we could say, Lord, I don't need anything else. David's not done with the care of the shepherd, but right there is enough to just sing his praises all day long. In the great shepherd I am made complete. In the great shepherd I am at peace. In the great shepherd I am restored and made righteous. Questions, thoughts, comments. Unmute yourself if you got comments yes. or questions. If you have a question or a comment, unmute it and, and ask away. We'll we'll open it up for about five or ten minutes. I've got an amen on, on chat. <laughs> Any questions? Any thoughts? Hello, this is Jason in Colorado. Hey, Jason. Hello. 
Um, during the restoration process, um, it's kind of a twofold question. Can it be painful? <laughs> and the second one is, um, you kind of answered it earlier. When we can't see, just put your hope in Christ and follow that. He is the path. Yes. But a lot of the times I struggle with how do I determine which way to go? Okay. Let me answer your first one first. If you remember what I said about the sheep, that when they're when they're cast down and they're over on their backs and the blood rushes from their legs, have you ever had your arm or your hand fall asleep? Yes. <laughs> okay. So is it painful when the blood begins to rush back into your hand? You feel the needles and the pins. It's and more it painful when... Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, to answer your question, yes, sometimes restoration can be painful. Um, I would also challenge us and understand that many times the lessons that we need to learn are only learned through that kind of pain. Um, Christ never promised that the Christian life would be easy. He promised that he would be with us. So with that, it's a great, great question. Yes restoration can sometimes be painful. I will tell you, I'll just go back to the story of my tooth. Uh, 12 shots of Novocaine in my mouth to restore my tooth back and then six weeks of braces through my gums, that was not a fun experience. Um, but here I am, you know, a couple of years later from my high school years. And uh, <laughs> my, Diane, you're not supposed to laugh at that. Uh, and my two front teeth are still in place. A little bit yellowed, but still in place. Restoration can be painful, yes. Second question, um, and, and maybe even more to the point, how do you choose the path? Um, lots of prayer, continuing to lean on him, understanding that if you take a wrong step, he will pull you back. Um, but the, the total point of, of making those steps and, and moving one step at a time is you're following the shepherd, not taking your eye off the shepherd. Watching him, following him, a step at a time, not a leap. Remember that, that the Christian walk is a Christian, Christian walk, it's not a Christian sprint. And a walk is a step at a time. It is patient, slow, methodical, one step at a time. Um, how you know? My experience is you know when you've stepped off. You know when you're on the wrong path. Remember, you have the Holy Spirit indwelling you. Completely rely on you being yielded to the Spirit, and He will direct you appropriately. Good question. Thank you. Yeah, other questions? Mark, I was thinking about previous psalm where you talk about us as being image bearers. Yes. And saw, uh, and as sheep were image bearers, uh, I was trying to think, gosh, they're restored. And so you helped me uh, realize, what can sheep give back? I mean, they, they seem so needy, and yet uh, <laughs> we can... We can, I don't know, I, f I find like, uh, can they, are, we are image bearers, and yet we are to, uh, as Jesus said to um, Peter, now he transitions to be, a, he's very needy, he needs restoration, and yet he is to be a shepherd. Yes. Yeah, let, me, let me, yeah, let me do a little clarification there. Um, First of all, as sheep, and you can only take certain analogies just so far, um, mm. one of the things that reflects well on the shepherd is that the sheep are happy, that they are well fed, that they are well cared for. They're not diseased sheep. They don't, they, they don't look like diseased sheep. It shows that the shepherd, the shepherd has cared for them well part of our reflection to the world, and I'm not trying to put any kind of a mask on us or trying to say, you know, go out there and, and not, be, um, not be real, but I am saying that we need to take stock of how we are reflecting the shepherd's care for us. 
if the shepherd has cared for us, does the world know it? Does the world know that the shepherd cares for us? Does the world know who our shepherd is? That's first. Um, you asked a really interesting question, and that is, what can the sheep give back? Um, I will tell you, an obedient sheep brings a smile to the face of the shepherd. Um, so obedience is one huge part of that. And Jason, maybe that's even an answer to your question, too. The scriptures give us. Um, in fact, John tells us what the definition of love is. It's obeying the commands. That shows our love for the shepherd, that we are o obedient to the shepherd. So those two things I could easily see, um, we are his image bearers, and now I can take this forward, um, and where the analogy stops, we have the character of God built into us. And so how we reflect the character of God to the world is how we bear his image. The sheep are not made in the image of the shepherd. But from that standpoint, we, how we reflect the image of the shepherd, how we reflect the shepherd to the world shows the world the care that the shepherd takes of us. Make sense? Yes, Mar very good. Yeah. Uh, this is Melanie. There. You have a friend there on your right. <laughs> right. Oh, yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> She's more than a friend. <laughs> um, I was wondering on that second example where the sheep goes into the territory that it doesn't belong yes. in and, and so becomes subject to a new master, so to speak. When the shepherd comes to restore the sheep in that instance, is it just a matter of coming and getting the sheep, or did the shepherd actually have to buy the sheep back? Typically, the shepherd had to buy the sheep back. Um, and it depends okay. on, it, understand that it depends if the sheep wanders in and then is taken by the owner of that pasture, then, then the shepherd has to buy the sheep back. Um, so first and foremost, it's the shepherd keeping the sheep from wandering into territory that is not theirs. The analogy specifically is that that pasture is green pasture. It's, it's another green pasture. And so we as, we as sheep will wander into whatever looks good to us. We'll wander into it without really a whole lot of thought about what the danger is. Um, but if, and it's a great question, Melanie, if the shepherd, if the shepherd doesn't let me rephrase that. If the sheep wanders in and stays in there long enough to be captured by the owner of that plot, then the shepherd has to come back and buy the sheep back from, from that owner. Um, the beautiful part of it is, remember, we talked um, some time ago about the fact that the sheep are actually earmarked as a part of that flock. So the way that the shepherd can go in there and buy them back is to say, you see the mark on that ear, that is my sheep. I will, I will buy him back, uh, which now gives us so, not only restoration, but it gives us yeah. redemption. So with the analogy of us being shepherds, like um, Jesus's comments to Peter, you know, feed my sheep and whatever, we need to be willing to go in and restore from another field. So what what does that look like? What what is what is that saying to us? Well, remember there's a couple of things you have to keep into consideration here. First of all, that as a sheep wanders into some other field, they also have to follow the lead of the shepherd out. Um, mm -hmm. We are we have many friends, relatives who have wandered into other fields um, as as we have, and you know, there, there's all sorts of uh, scripture across the board that talk to us about how we go talk to a brother, how we go bring and how we can help restore back to that relationship. Um, part of us is we need to follow the lead of the shepherd when the shepherd tells us to go, when the Holy Spirit says, now go help restore that one. Um, so there are those instances in where we can move in and help restore someone back to the relationship and, and restore them back to the relationship with the Lord. But remember, um, there's two sides to that whole part. We may desire for them to be restored. They may not desire to be restored. Exactly. So there, there is that, um, 
there is that secondary side. Let me use your your um, your friend on your right there for just a moment. Um, you can pretty easily tell when your dog is really happy to see you and really wants to follow you because that tail is wagging. There's nothing that excites our shepherd more than when he sees the joy on our face for being in, in his midst and in his company. We want to restore people back who have wandered off. We should be looking to restore people who have wandered off. Just remember that we can't always restore people who have wandered off if they don't choose to be restored, if they don't want to be restored. Right. So it still doesn't negate us giving the opportunity to try, but remember that's got to be a, a work of the shepherd as well. Mark, this is Pam yes. Beasley. Yes. I would like to say, I really appreciate that answer you gave to Jason of um, don't take your eye off the shepherd. It's one step at a time. It's a slow, methodical process because Aaron and I are kind of going through a hard uh, place in our church right now. And um, we're really, and, I, and I've been asking that same question. How, how, and how are how am I going to know? How are we going to know the Lord's leading? So that was really good because I know sometimes it's like I want, okay, what's the answer right now? You know, I don't want to wait. I was like, just go ahead and tell me the answer so I can move on. But that was really good to help reinforce that one day at a time, one step at a time, and just keeping our eye on the shepherd. So I, I really liked that answer. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. And hi, Christine. <laughs> um, question that came up um, about our whole uh, coronavirus situation right now. Could it start a revival toward God or does the world ignore God? Um, here's what I will tell you, and, and I, I'll make this statement even out of Psalm 23. Um, God does not cause evil. God is a God who is a good God. He does not cause evil. But in his creation, God takes responsibility for what enters into his creation. This is the exact same thing that the shepherd does. The shepherd doesn't bring evil into the flock. But if evil enters the flock, the shepherd has the responsibility for, for, getting, for taking care of that evil to the best of the sheep. This whole dilemma we're sitting in today, I don't even wanna to begin to speculate uh, questions like, is this something of God's judgment on us? Is there something there? What I, want to, what I want to focus our attention on is, what is God wanting to teach you in the midst of this particular situation? Um, this may be one of those, Jason, where, it's, where restoration is gonna be painful for this nation, maybe painful for this world to be restored and our restoration may look different. Um, but I will tell you, I, the world does more and more and more and more ignore God. And my wife and I have been praying um, on a pretty consistent basis that what happens because of this would be that people open their eyes more and more and more toward the Lord. That we see how fragile we are. We see how something like a virus can absolutely turn our world upside down and we, we, it is our prayer that we begin to see the magnificence of God. And think about it from this standpoint, the magnificence of God in the fact that something as small as a virus can absolutely turn our world upside down. Imagine what our faith and trust in the God of the universe can do to this world. Could restore it and write it beautifully. You talk about the faith of a mustard seed uh, a virus is a whole lot smaller than a mustard seed. That much faith in the Lord could absolutely turn this world on its ear. Um, and perhaps that's what the Lord is doing. I would, I would start this uh, not quite on such a grand scale in terms of the discussion. I would start this on the discussion of in the midst of this, what is God desiring to do to me? Maybe this is bringing quiet and peace into my life. Maybe this is giving me more time to slow down to take it a step at a time, to recognize the shepherd in my life where I haven't recognized him before. 
maybe these are opportunities for me to love, find new ways to love on people. Um, maybe there are all sorts of different things that God wants to teach each one of us individually, and he, he will utilize this, Romans 8, 28. He will utilize this for good. Um, how is he going to utilize this for good in your own life? Any other thoughts, questions? I would like to share something, and I've been sitting here wondering if I should or if I can even get through it, but um trying to figure out how to say it just briefly. Um, Jason had asked if restoration can hurt, and I can tell you it can physically, emotionally, spiritually hurt big time. I have a granddaughter, two granddaughters, but this particular one um, hasn't spoken to me and doesn't want anything to do with me for over three years now. And um, I have been begging God for me, just to show me how I can do something to bring her back. Because I didn't do anything to cause her to leave. I, I just, so every time I pray, what can I do? Since we've been studying the uh, 23rd Psalm, every week he speaks. I am the good shepherd. I'm all you need. Anyway, and I go back through it every single time. To make a long story short, over the weekend, I have been really focusing on reading the Bible, listening to as many sermons of people that I admire as I can, and devoting the day to prayer, the Saturday and Sunday to prayer. Well, this past Sunday, I, folk, I have seven grandchildren, and I focus on one at a time, and this particular week, this granddaughter was on my mind all day and I prayed and I prayed and I said Lord I guess I'm going to have to get to a point where I am at peace you are all I need I'm I don't have to this doesn't have to be something that happens in my lifetime which I'd come to that conclusion before anyway I prayed for her all day so yesterday I'm you know cleaning my coffee pot cleaning my kitchen just listening to praise and worship music and she called me out of the, just out of the blue. Are you okay, Nanny? I've been worried about you. Is somebody getting you food? Are you, um, are you lonely? I, I just, I was just so blown away and I real quietly, calmly tried to say, oh yes, I'm just, I'm not lonely. I miss people cause you know, I'm an extrovert, but how are you? And she said, well, I've really, been worried about you and thinking about you and I just want you to know how much I love you and I'm thinking to myself if I hadn't listened to what the shepherd said to me about leaving it in his hands I mean there's just a whole bunch of stuff he said I would have gone before him this was her coming to me he restored her to me and at the end of the conversation, she had told me, she's a, a senior in college. And of course they've canceled graduation and all of that. But anyway, she said, I lost my job tutoring cause I can't do anything one-on-one -on -one, and we're having to do our school, you know, online and I miss people and da 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 da. And so anyway, I said, um, could you use a little extra cash since you don't have a job? And she said, oh, no, I would never take money from you after just coming back to you. That's not mm. why I came back. I mm. came back because I love you mm. and I miss you. And I don't want this to be what you think is the reason. And I said, I don't think it is the reason. I think this is God bringing you back. And she began to talk a little bit about the virus and her fears and everything. And I said, I know that you've kind of walked away from God a little bit, but after we hang up, would you go read Habakkuk 3? Because it, it could have been written in today's time. And just remember, this is a prophet of Israel that's writing it and remembering how good God is. So for me, yes, it's painful, but the obedience part that you just spoke of is such an important part of listening and letting him guide us 
and walk us down those paths because we don't know. I'm telling you, sheep are stupid and I'm probably the dumbest. <laughs> so thank you for this because so many things are happening in, in life right now that God is turning around for good. He is good all the time. So thank you, Mark. No question. No question. Well, we will tackle. Thanks for sharing. Oh, you're welcome. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing. Uh, and, and just excitement about the fact that we see an example of restoration. That is just yes. beautiful. Yes. Um, we will tackle the next verse, verse four, next week. It is a big one. Um, lots in that one. Um, look forward to having you back then. Um, stay in verses one through three. Like I said, you could put a period at the end of them and uh, could really just spend some time in those first three verses. Um, been great to see 32 people on this, yes. on this call and uh, wonderful stuff happening in and appreciate you who have put in some chat comments. Um, so we thank you for all, all that is that you're participating in this. Let me make sure you understand there's two things that are also uh, happening um, coming out of the Grace Center for Spiritual Development tonight. We start the first of three nights of studying biblical leadership. Um, tonight, I'll be teaching along with Carlin Charleston, um, the head of Erase Race. We'll be dealing with the biblical leadership of Moses and the biblical leadership of Joseph. On Thursday, there's two more of our guest speakers that will be speaking on biblical leadership of, I can't remember the names of who, but we've got Elijah in there, we've got Nehemiah in there, we've got Deborah in there, and we've got, um, David. David. So those David. four, yeah, we'll be covering those four in tonight, next uh, on Thursday, and then the following week. And that um, you, it's the same thing. You come in, lock into Blue Jeans. You can get that down off the Grace app. You can register there. You can register through Grace Center for Spiritual Development and Grace School of Theology. Um, so that's the first. Um, and then coming up in April, we hope that we'll be back live. But if we're not live, we'll be doing it again here. We're going to be putting on what's called our basic program, Biblical Application for Service in Christ. And we're going to be dealing with the basics of Bible study, the basics of theology, the basics of discipleship, the basics of grace. Um, those four issues we'll be studying uh, in depth going into the month of April. So. Uh, and I think Shamika just put up on the chat where you can register for the Biblical Leadership Series. Thank you, Shamika. So if you go to the chat area, you can check into those and, and uh, sign up for that tonight, Thursday night and next week. Um, okay. I Mark, think that's Daniel. Yeah. Hey, Mark, yeah, Jas on. Jasmine was just giving you a shout out to BASIC. I don't know if you saw that, but Jasmine was holding up her BASIC study guide. Oh, she has <laughs> oh there it is. is. <laughs> yeah. We have We have an alumni. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. right. So ja yes. Jasmine has been yeah. through the study. And then the other one I was going to mention, um, hopefully everybody got an email, but next Wednesday, April 8th, and then the following Wednesday, April 15th, oh, Diane right. just mentioned Habakkuk. And Dwight Edwards is going to do a two-week Bible study specifically mm -hmm. on Habakkuk that is dealing with um, going from being a warrior to a worshiper. And so yes. it's specifically for kind of the COVID crisis that we find ourselves in. And so that would be another one to look out for since everybody is doing such a good job on using their uh, blue jeans Absolutely. to log on live and participate. Um, there's another Wednesday Bible study opportunity for you coming up. So tune into that one too. So you got three Excited things as well as, as well as staying a part of this. So we've got mm -hmm. three more weeks in this wonderful, wonderful Psalm. Um, and you've got the Biblical Leadership Series, you've got the Basic Program, and then the Habakkuk Study. So a lot of stuff coming your way that you can log on to just like you've done here. Yes. Let me pray for us, and we will conclude. Father God, we thank you for the incredible words from your servant David. The incredible words that tell us in you we have completeness, wholeness. In you we have peace. In you we have restoration. We have righteousness that you have given us the great shepherd and he stands visible in front of us for all of us to follow. Lord, I pray we would be followers of the shepherd. 
and that you would lead us in these difficult times, that you would lead us to what you tell us is important and what you tell us is important about life, the following of you and moving us to be more in your image. God, show us the people you want us to touch this week. Show us the people that need restoration. Show us what you need to restore in our own lives. And we ask you to do that work for your glory and your sake. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you all for being a part. We'll see you next week and hopefully see you tonight. Yes, see you next week, Mark.